So again, open your Bibles up to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to keep right on going with our, uh, with our weekly series in 2 Corinthians, which is um, a letter of, of encouragement to the Corinthian church after having been sternly, sternly rebuked in 1 Corinthians for uh, an entire list of of things that they had begun doing in the flesh, that they had been doing uh, in their own power and not God's power, and as a result had fallen into all kinds of error. And in 2 Corinthians, you have uh, Paul explaining his heart to them, partially because he has enemies there who are then saying, well, he doesn't really love us, he doesn't really care for us, or he wouldn't speak to us this way. Um, and so now Paul is entering the section where he's actually going to defend, having to defend his apostleship to them because uh, there are basically wheat, there, there are tares among the wheat that the enemy has sown to try and spoil their crop. And that is, that's what we're dealing with here uh, in this passage. And we're just going to read um, the first four verses. It says "Would in, in chapter 11, verse 1, would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. So, our title of the message this morning um, is based on a couple of the, the words here, uh, where it talks about bearing with him. Um, and so, bearing with and bearing the truth how to hear the messenger of God and bear with him. Um, they say that ignorance is bliss, right? Um, and nobody likes being told what to do, what to think, or what to believe all the time. We like to come to our own conclusions and the sincerity of our own faiths with the information that we have. However, there are times when your right to remain ignorant must be violated for your own good. We must face the reality that we can be sincere and sincerely wrong at the same time. Once convinced that we are sincerely wrong in anything, we then bear the responsibility to carry our new convictions with courage and see them enforced in our lives. That's what we sang about this morning is courage to follow through. When this follow through does not happen, then the passion and courage and indeed foolishness of preaching must be applied again. The Apostle Paul is being forced to defend his right to correct them about their failings and beliefs while contrasting his forthrightness with the flattery and even the open abuses of their enemies. And it's because they refuse to pull their own weight in this process. Paul is not arguing a lack of sincerity in this passage on their part. They've corrected some of what he wrote to them about at first, but because of their sincerity, he is going to explain his reasons for his passion and show them that they are still not treating God or himself fairly in the courts of their minds. Lesson for us is to be sure we don't come short of receiving a message from God because of a lack of follow-through in our own lives. Catch that? That's, that's what this message is about this morning. To be sure that we don't fail to miss what God has for us because of a lack of follow-through in our own lives. Oh, I obey part of it. I'm pretty good up to now. You've got to follow through all the way. You have to. So... The battle for the mind. Godly jealousy is a real and necessary thing. 
Godly jealousy is a real and necessary thing. If God didn't care about you, he would let you do whatever you wanted. Right? But he does love and care for you, so he will come to you and approach you when you are off course. So the first thing we're going to talk about is verse 1 there, where it says, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly. In other words, just be patient with me because I'm going to kind of play the fool here a little bit, and I'm going to press you on these issues a little bit further than maybe you want to go. I'm going to push you. This is my folly. This is my foolishness, as he's saying. And he says, and then he says this, and indeed, bear with me. Bearing with the pastor means sharing his burden. When, you, when, when he wanted them to bear with him, he wanted them to share in his vision. He wanted them to have be on the same page with him. Now, some of you guys, if you're looking at another translation or something like that, sometimes it will say something to the effect of, in that last part it says, and indeed bear with me, or it says, it says or you do bear with me. Now, the reason why, and it's funny that this is, and it's ironic that this is this way, but the reason why some of those changes are different because sarcasm is very difficult to translate, right? Because you're saying one thing, but your voice inflection means something else. And the only way you can tell which way it should be is on the context. Because it says down there in verse 4 that he's bearing with their enemies. They bear with their enemies, the people who are abusing them, the people who are flattering them to move them away from the truth. They bear with them. They'll listen to them all day long. But they won't listen to him who in love and passion rebukes them strongly. And, and so that sarcasm makes this passage difficult to translate. So when it's so now, why is that important? Because it can mean the opposite. Right? If it says you do are bearing with the, bearing with him, that would be an encouragement. Oh yes, and you do bear with me. Well, the fact is they weren't bearing with him. They weren't pulling their weight, and that's the whole point of this passage. They have not been pulling their weight. They've not been doing what they are supposed to do and leaving it all up to Paul to bear this burden. And what's funny is is if they wouldn't be straddling the fence on these issues, he wouldn't have to be using sarcasm, which makes it confusing, right? If he could just be straight with them about what they're doing and just say, hey, this is, this is what, you know, you guys are doing great. If he could be encouraging, he wouldn't have to go this route. But he does have to go through this route. And it kind of sounds like the church today, does it not? Everyone mistrusts everyone else because of abuses and neglect, which confuses communication, right? Everybody takes everything everybody says with a grain of salt because nobody's forthright. And just letting it, the chips fall where they may. Saying what it means and meaning what it says. That's where we need to be with each other. We need to be honest. Okay? My brethren, these things ought not so to be. So bearing with him, point A there, bearing with him means allowing the, the true vision from God to be your vision. When God tells you that something is the way it is in the life of your in your life or in the church's life, allow that to be your vision. Carry that vision. When you see the 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 church's direction is being this thing, go with it. Don't sit on your hands and oh well, we'll, we'll just see how this works out. Get on board. Let his bear with him. Help him carry the load. That's what it means. Not, not just sit back and advise to shape the vision after your fancy, but bear with him to make it happen. The next and point B there, bearing with him means not disregarding his insight as mere co coincidence or opinion when it in fact applies and your spirit confirms it. Folks, I know what it's like to sit under the preaching of the Word of God and know for certain how did he know what I did last night? How did he know that this was the, what I was thinking about this whole week? How did he know that? That's not him, that's the Holy Spirit. Okay? 
applying the Word of God to you. And you need to count it as, indeed, the Word of God. Because if the Word of God is coming to you, you have no choice but to obey it, or else be in rebellion. Oh, well, that's just his opinion. Oh, it's just a coincidence. There's no such thing. There is no such thing. God ordains everything. God or plans out everything so that you might be conformed to the image of Christ. Do not disregard it when he pokes your heart. Because the more you do that, the less sensitive you become to it, and eventually you start listening to the wrong people, doing the wrong things, and living the wrong life. There's a great verse in Psalms. It's Psalms 141, verse 5. And I want to show you this because I want this to be your attitude when any time you find yourself running afoul of the Word of God and you need to be opposed to your face by the man of God. Psalms 141, verse 5, right smack in the middle of your Bible. I hope everybody brought their Bibles. I hope everybody's reading their Bibles. Knows exactly where it is and doesn't have to be told. But we'll tell you. Get you there. Right? Psalms 141 verse 5 says, says this. Let the righteous smite me and it shall be a kindness. Right? If the righteous comes up to you and smacks you in the face and says, Get your butt in gear. You know what you ought to say? That's kindness. Well, we, what's the verse in Proverbs say about um, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful? Right? People who only flatter you, who only tell you what you want to hear, are liars. If, no, if they will not at one, any time confront you about your follow-through with your life in Christ... If they will not do that, that is not your friend. That is your enemy. I hate the, uh, the you-go-girl mentality. There's these, these popular Christian books about girls stop apologizing. No, salvation begins with apologizing. It's confession of sin. If you have hardened your heart so that you cannot apologize, you're a fool. You are a fool and you need to start bearing your own burden because you're not pulling your weight. Psalms 141 verse 5 says, Let the righteous smite me and it shall be a kindness. Let him reprove me and it shall be an excellent oil which shall not break my head. It's an anointing. That's what he's talking about. When, when Jesus Christ, who is the righteous, by the way, in Scripture, whenever it's talking about the righteous, it's talking about Him ultimately. Because that's where our righteousness is derived. When it says the righteous smites you, that's Jesus. It might be in the form of a brother and sister in Christ coming and saying, hey, come help me do this. And you think, I should have been doing this all along. Hey, that's a kindness. That's Jesus Christ showing up to you and saying, hey, Let's get going. And guys, if there's a problem in your house, even if it's your wife's problem with God, when Jesus Christ comes and knocks on your door, you know what he's going to say? Even if your wife answers the door, do you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, is the man of the house home? your job to be the head of your house. We have so many men not pulling their weight. Why are women the only people willing to teach Sunday school? Where's your relationship with Christ? Where is it? Do you not care about this generation at all? My God, get on board. Pull your weight. They're dying. If we don't do something soon, this will be the last generation of believers in Eastport who know the gospel. The last one. Where's your commitment to your Savior? Where's your commitment to your husband? 
You're going to marry him for all of eternity. Be faithful to him. And when he comes up and says, get on board. Get your excuses out and get on board. It's unexcusable. Bearing with him makes him not making your pastor do all the work of ministry, of teaching, of discerning, and of correcting the flock. There ought to be some self-correction in some of these things. When I hear people gossiping, and you sit there and let it happen, I shouldn't be the one that has to come to you and say, stop talking about somebody who isn't here. I shouldn't have to be the one that do, does that. You should be the one that stops it. And that's just one of a myriad of things. And that's what small towns are like. I understand that. What else do we have to do because nobody shot anybody lately? Right? That's an excuse. Jealousy. Point number two. Godly jealousy. And this is from verse number two. It says this. Well, let me get back there. I'm going to read you Psalms again. Verse number two says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That is the spiritual vision that you need to have of your relationship with God. That you're going to be married to Him someday. Do you bring Him honor and glory? Are you submitting to Him as you're supposed to? Is he your head? Is he your authority? Or are you your own authority? If you're not submitting to him and questioning everything that he says and does and everything that he comes to you about, you are in rebellion. There's no other word for it. Jealousy is the pastor empathizing with the bridegroom, with the groom and the bride. I am not here criticizing the church. Because the fact is, the church doctrinally is undefiled. She has her husband's righteousness. We have far too many people who are willing to slander the church. Oh, those Christians, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. Oh, well, you know, you know, the church hasn't done it right for years, so we need to go over here and do this thing outside of the church. What organization did God start? He started the church. That's the one that's God ordained. Well, I'm just doing my own thing out here. You're in rebellion. And you're not behaving as the bride of Christ. There's only one bride. There's only one. The church is where your sacrifice is supposed to take place. That's where it's supposed to happen. Doing it on your own means being a maverick and being in rebellion to God. The pastor must, must, must identify with the true bride of Christ, the one that is undefiled. But he is supposed to be jealous over her with godly jealousy. If, you're doing, if you are degrading her, he should oppose you to your face. Because of the groom who is going to hold him accountable for how he led the bride of Christ. You have no idea how scary that is. You have no idea how much I don't want to disappoint him. I want him to be proud of me. Follow me. I will do whatever I can to help you. I will do whatever I can. And I will do it with the utmost integrity that I possess. And believe me, it gets corrected all the time in very basic things. And it's one of those things that I look at and I take very seriously. Now, first of all, I want you to understand, don't confuse man's corrupt version of jealousy with God's. There, we are in a world rife with jealousy gone wrong. It leads to spousal abuse. It leads to all kinds of terrible things. Because, and I lay this 
largely at the men of God, they want to substitute their jealousy for God's. They want to rail on people for their pet peeves instead of God's pet peeves. Right? When somebody has an axe that they want to grind constantly, the same thing over and over and over again, that's not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will sometimes change the subject. Right? You're here to preach his message. Not your, not, he's, the pastor's there to preach Jesus' message, not his own. It is easy for a pastor to confuse his human love with God's love. It's very easy to do that. Our natural loves are good things. But any time you allow your love or even your jealousy to replace God's love, it becomes a demon. Right? How many times have you seen pastors in the pulpit manipulate people emotionally to have his way done at the next public meeting? How many times have you seen a pastor manipulate people to get more donations? Right? That's the big one that we see, especially in the prosperity gospel, which is not a gospel, by the way. It's a false gospel. What actually has to happen is the pastor has to set aside his love and his emotion in favor of God's. That's our job, is to set ourselves aside. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting things about this is there are times when even I might substitute your good for God's good. His good is infinitely better. So I must set mine and yours aside for his because ultimately his vision sees where I cannot. His vision sees the heart. His vision sees where we, where we need to be seen. And once that vision is established, I must give up trying to be good for you and let him be good for you because none of us are good. We follow the thing that good is according to Psalms 38.10. We follow God who is alone good. And so and when we do that, the great thing is when a pastor chooses to die to himself, the jealousy that he expresses is now God's and not his own. And that part can be trusted. The other part cannot. So look with me. Let's look at God's jealousy again because I don't want this to be confused in any way. Look in Exodus. Chapter 20 and verse 5. We're going to employ something called the law of first mention. It's a Bible study method that allows you to see the first time God something mentions something in Scripture. And as such, because God is consistent and relying upon that trait, when you see God mention a principle or a concept or a word, the first time, it establishes the pattern for the rest of Scripture. Because God is consistent. He always does things the same way. Same author of all 66 books. And in Exodus chapter 20, in verse 5, it says this. Thou shalt... Um, yeah. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. I'm talking about false gods. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. He is jealous. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. Notice there are people who worship other gods aren't neutral to God. They're not neutral. They hate him. And this is the law, by the way. This is the beginning of the law. This is the beginning of the Ten Commandments. Right? This is where that takes place. And he says right there that he will revenge those who do not obey them to the third and the fourth generation. Do we or do we not have generational issues? Yeah. Big time. The question is, where did it go off the rails? 
with what generation did it go off the rails? Was it two generations ago? Was it one generation ago? Was it this generation? Now, you say, you might say, well, that, see, that's the Old Testament law. Guess what? I hate to tell you. It's worse in the New Testament. Look in Hebrews chapter 10. chapter 10, verse 23 through 31. It says this, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke one another unto love and to good works. We need to be paying attention to the other to provoke each other. We need to be provoking each other. Christian, too many times we are too nice to people who ought to be accountable for their actions. Provo and you're not provoking them to a bad thing. You're provoking them to love and to good works. Let's do this. This is great. This is an opportunity. Let's rise to the occasion. Right? Let us consider one another. He says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Do you see the day approaching? Then why would you not be here with other believers? Why would you not want instruction? Why would you not want to grow? Why would you not, what other priority could you possibly have? As the day approaches. You know what the day is in Scripture? It's the second coming. It's when God lands on the earth and squashes it. Okay? This is an important deal. And look at, and look at what it says, though, in verse 26. After it says this, he says, For if we willfully, if we sin willfully... After that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Now, realize that this is talking to the Hebrews. That's the name of the book, right? And this was a witness to them when the book of Acts was still being written, or it was still was taking place. All the Hebrews had not yet heard about Jesus' death as they were scattered around the world. They hadn't heard about it yet. But once they received that truth... They could not go back to the temple and have that sacrifice work because God had made his sacrifice and there were to be no more once for all, as the book says. Okay? There remaineth therefore... I mean, every sin you sin is willful. So don't think that that means you lost your salvation. Right? The sacrifice has been made. This is, this is talking about a specific people in a specific context. But look at what this says, verse 28. Or sorry, 27. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. That's what we were talking about. How God will repay those that hate him to their face. Right? God will. 100%. And, we, and you guys say, well, you know, well, but we just serve a God. And, you know, I just believe in the New Testament that, that love is the main thing. Folks, if he doesn't love you, he wouldn't rebuke you. He just let you go. Verse 29 says this. And now this, now you're going to put it in a New, Te New Testament context, right? Under the law, he repaid them to their face under the third and the fourth generation. It's worse in the New Testament. He says, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. 
We sang the song this morning, Grace, Grace, God's Grace. How dare you disobey Him with that grace having been extended. You do not step on Jesus Christ and not have God go, Oh, really? Really? You're going to step on my son? You're going to step over him to do that? Really? No, no. He loves his son. And guess what? He loves his bride and expects more from her than he does others. He says, for we know, verse 30, for we know him that saith, vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. The book of, of Peter says that it is, the time has come that judgment begin at the house of God. Judgment begins with us. Because if it doesn't begin with us, then where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? How are they going to have any example? It must begin with us. It must. And he says this, For it is, it, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Folks, we serve a living God who sees you, he sees what you do, and what you neglect to do. You are accountable. Do not defile his bride. Do not make her unclean. Do not disappoint your Lord. Don't do it. Don't do it. He loves you and gave himself for you. Why would you do that? Godly jealousy is the passion of a love that will not let his son's sacrifice go unheeded. He will not let that go. He will absolutely repay that unto the third and the fourth generation. Wake up to the reality, and so this is why Paul is beside himself with them, and with us, if it applies. You are in reality, you are in, you, in reality, you need to wake up to the danger of the fact that you are in an open warfare. You are in an open warfare. And you, you, if you think that that warfare is not over something specific. It is. It's over our eternal marriage vows. The devil wants to corrupt those so bad, he wants you to cheat on Jesus with everything in his mind. He wants you to do it. And he will use every weapon in his arsenal to be able to get you to do it. And the question is, is how many generations will we allow to perish if we do not heed a word spoken from heaven? How many generations will we allow to perish if we do not heed Jesus' sacrifice for us, meaning that we ought to sacrifice our lives for our brethren? In other words, showing up when they need you. Bearing the burden with them. Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ is not vacation land. Vacation is not written in Scripture. Neither, by the way, is retirement. There is no discharge from that war. You are responsible until you stop drawing breath to love Jesus Christ with all of your life, all of your time, and everything that you have. 100%. Holding nothing back. And that's what he has called all of us to. That's normal Christianity. That's bottom line Christianity. Dropping a quarter in a plate once a week for an hour while you sleep and wish you were at home listening to the baseball game is not Christianity. That is false gospel. That is not a living God. That's a dead God. Why is eSports gospel community in such peril? It is the failure, my, and this I believe is true, it is the failure of the bride to retrain, retain her simplicity in favor of programs, in favor of popularity, and in favor of, in favor of passivity. I think that's what's caused it, 100%. 
we are condemning our neighbors and our loved ones to hell by continuing that passivity. Ezekiel 33, 8 says that the Lord has set a watchman and that if that watchman fails to blow the horn and people perish in their sins, he will require their blood at the watchman's hands. Christian, you are the watchman. You are supposed to be watching for his coming and warning everyone of impending arrival. He is going to arrive and you need to be, and you're accountable. You're going to go to heaven with somebody else's blood on your hands. That is not just for the pastor. Bear with us. Bear with us. We will help you in any way that we can, but there are no excuses. So notice here, back in 2 Corinthians, turn back there, that he attacks where he can. Satan attacks where he can. Second Corinthians chapter 11, he says, verse 3, he says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Guys, it is a simple thing to serve God. It just requires everything. Right? It's a very simple thing to walk with God. It just requires all. Withholding nothing. That's easy. Just write him a blank check. He'll fill it in. And it'll be a lot bigger than you think it can be. And then he'll grow you into it. And you'll be amazed. You will be amazed and transformed. But Satan attacks you where he can, which is your mind. Right? He can't attack your salvation because that's secure. Jesus says in, in uh, the book of John, chapter 10, um, verse 27 through 30, that no man is able to pluck us out of his hand. No one. No one can pluck us out of his hand. He says, because he's God. Right? Who, who can steal? Who's power, more powerful than God? No one. Right? But if he can convince you that either you don't have your salvation, or if he can convince you, just to sit there, or he can convince you that retirement's a thing, it's not a thing. Okay? If he can convince you that phoning it in or writing a check to cover it will work, he's got you. Your mind has been corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. It is super simple. It is super simple. It's so simple that we don't want to do it. We want to have something to add to it. We want to have something to put in, to complicate it, to make it highly esteemed in the eyes of men. We want to have a buzzword, a catchphrase, a paradigm. Right? No. It's simple. It's super simple. Add nothing there to. Satan is not greater than God. And if he can convince you in any area that he is, the problem is we spend way too much time looking at the evil in the world instead of looking to Christ and overcoming as he overcame and sat down at the right hand of the throne. He sat down, folks. He's done. He won. The issue is, why are you looking at the world and wondering why it's going to pop? We, I, I, I can count how many times I have heard people saying, well, it's just not the way it used to be. Yeah, it is. It's exactly the way it used to be. Because it keeps reproducing itself. It is the way it used to be. The problem is, we need to turn off Fox News and get out the good news. The problem is we need to stop watching Game of Thrones and get on your knees before the throne. The problem is we need to stop trying to occupy Wall Street and occupy till he comes. Those are false purposes. Those are diversions. Those are entertainment that, suppl that supplants joy. 
Entertainment is not joy. It's a counterfeit of joy. And one of the things that the church has done, which I believe we will stand to account for, is drawing people with entertainment instead of with the word, instead of with the gospel. Because what you draw them with, you've got to keep them with. And why do we think the generations keep falling away? Because you give them a piece of candy for showing up. Not so that they can have a, a relationship with the God who loved them and gave himself for them. You're bribing them. Well, no wonder they don't come back. Because they can get bribed anywhere. Matter of fact, their, bribery, their entertainment and their bribery is a lot better than ours. The world is much better at that than we are. Because that's their God. We cannot use the devil's tools and pretend that they will work in God's house. That's not the way it works. We must recover the simplicity of being his help meet. You know how simple that is? You know, what is it in scripture? The, the bride, Eve, is called Adam's help meet. And that word, that Old Testament word meet means fitting. Right? It meets the need. Right? She, was, she met the need. That's our job as Christians is to meet his need. Whatever he wants, we say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is done in heaven. His, his will is law when he speaks it. The only people who fail to in, implement it is us. Russ talked about total depravity in Sunday school. Folks, rebellion is written on our hearts. Every little thing in which you will not submit and obey is open rebellion in heaven. That is the enemy's tactics. And in that thing, you are a slave of sin. We've been made free. We've been offered freedom. Why would you go back and live in bondage? Run to your Lord. Run to Him. Stop focusing on the wrong things and focus on the right thing. Missing out on that mission can render you ineffective, adulterous, and deadly for generations. For generations. It's not just you that it affects. It's your kids and their kids. It's a terrible judgment. A terrible judgment. Is that vision your vision? Do you see it as so? It's what the Word of God says. You can't question it because it doesn't change. Our, the battle is for our minds. We're to bring every thought into the captivity of the obedience of Christ, as it said in the previous chapter. Seeing your identity outside of Christ is one of the ways in which Eve cheated on Adam. It's one of the ways that the bride cheats on her husband. Is seeing your identity outside of him. Well, I'm a this, and insert whatever it is you think that you are. If, you, if that does not happen to be, I am the bride of Christ, period and end of story, you are diverted. You are serving the wrong Lord. If in anything you think independently of your husband, if in anything you do not submit to his thoughts and his ways, as the heavens are higher than the earth, his ways are higher than ours. We have no right to question them. None whatsoever. And I guarantee you, the more I have studied scripture, I've had questions, I've had big questions, I've had hard questions. And you know what? You keep serving him, and all of a sudden one day, he answers that question. And all of a sudden, you realize he was so right all along. And I was so wrong all along. Remember, he's not questioning their sincerity. He's questioning their follow-through. No one's accusing you of being insincere. Some of these things were taught to us generation after generation after generation that it's okay to be this and this. It's not okay. This is real simple. There's one choice. Just one. That's it. That's the only choice you have because you're bought with a price. 
And lastly, being your own God is a sign. If you are your own God, what you want to do takes precedent over what God has going. You are a casualty of war. You are a casualty of war. There are things and attitudes that you need to remove out of your life that were taught to you generation after generation. That is not necessarily your fault, but it is your responsibility. God is not going to overlook those things when you have a word that is perfect to explain them to you. God is not going to overlook those things when you have his spirit who will apply them to you. He's not going to overlook that. You're not going to get to step on his son. I don't care who taught it to you. You do not step on Jesus Christ and have that go unaccounted for. We often feel that we are free, but in reality, we have given in to the enemy. And there is no discharge from that war. You cannot say, I am a hothouse flower. Right? You cannot say that the bugs have not gotten to you. They've gotten to me. There are things all the time that I look back on and go, man, and then you change them and it's like a light bulb goes on and all of your cares are lifted off of your shoulders and you know for certain I am now on the right path. I did this one thing for years and it it, it, it seemed right. That's what everybody said it was right. But it wasn't right. And as soon as you change it, It doesn't matter that's how you were raised. It doesn't matter what other standard can you possibly erect against Jesus Christ. We have to bring every thought into captivity. Every thought into captivity. Not just every action. Not just every attitude. Every thought needs to be captive to Him. Put simply, if you are breathing, you are to be fighting. This is a battle, guys. The battle is for the mind. You need to be fighting. Well, how do you fight? You replace your thoughts with his thoughts. That's what Scripture calls renewing your mind. How do I do that? Well, if I think I know something about something, then I look it up in the Bible. And what the Bible says alters what I think about that subject. And I can form, just like jealousy, right? We think of jealousy as a negative thing. When it's done by a holy God, it's a good thing. Because He loves you and will not let you go. He will not let you go. He is going to chase you. Guys, we count on that. We count on that. It's the, the, the book of Peter says that we, the first Peter says that we are kept by the power of God unto salvation. We're kept, we're protected, we're surrounded. If that power doesn't show up once in a while and correct your wandering, you are lost. This is a confirmation of salvation and that of God. That should be the joy and the rejoicing of your heart. It should be an excellent oil which will not break your head. It is an excellent oil. It's an anointing to have the Word of God come to you and say, Yes, my child, I'm going to paddle behind. But I love you. And I want you close to me. I don't want you far away. I want you with me on my mission. Because that will transform your life and make you profitable to me. What wouldn't you give for that? Well, let me tell you, folks, don't feel bad for being rebuked. Rejoice. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. That's proof of childhood. Proof. There is no discharge from this war. If you'd rather have peace and comfort than come to grips with the enemy at your gates, then you deserve the judgment and the confusion that awaits you at his appearing. Well, I thought I was okay. There's absolutely no reason for there to be any question in your mind about where you are with Jesus Christ at any moment. You should know, because the Word of God will show you. It's a mirror. 
It shows you every day. So you should absolutely know. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Right? And, we, and, and the most famous verse in the world right now is judge not, that you be not judged. The scripture says judge yourself. The issue is, not, the issue is judging like a hypocrite. You don't have to judge people and then go out and do the same thing yourself. That's the problem. You are to judge righteous judgments. Not according to the appearance. You don't accept people's appearances. You judge a righteous judgment. And that's where we stand with Christ. That's where we walk with Him. That's where, and when you are in the center of that, nothing can touch you. You are in an impregnable fortress where you cannot be harmed as soon as you step into that obedience. So the issue is, is there blood on your hands? So in conclusion, because remember what, what it says there in verse 4, For if he that cometh preaches to another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which we have not received, folks, that doesn't mean necessarily that you're acquiescing to a false doctrine. Right? It's just a wrong spirit. I, folks, we live in a place that has the spirit of retirement about it. It has the spirit of the attitude that I'm on vacay. Right? And people check out. As soon as they have five minutes, they go on. We used to call it in Virginia the competitive camping club. Summertime rolled out, the kids were out of school, and you could not get some of these parents and kids into church on a Sunday in the, in the summertime because they were camping. Well, or softball, volleyball, baseball, basketball, whatever sport there is. Did you know that there's less than a, a point, I think it's 0.02% chance that any person in a, involved in a sport will become a professional athlete? Did you know that there's a 100% chance that your child will stand before Jesus Christ someday? Play the odds. Let me throw you another statistic out to you. We focus on child ministry, and I said something about this earlier. We focus on child ministry, and particularly me. But do you know that if a child comes to Christ, there's less than a 3% chance that the rest of the family will come to faith as well? If a wife or a mother becomes a Christian, there's only a 17% chance that the rest of the family will come to faith. If the father or a husband comes to Christ, there's a 93% chance that the rest of the family will come to Christ. I say it again. Men, what are you doing? Are you reaching out to men? When you're hanging out at the coffee, at, drinking coffee at the gas station, are you witnessing to them? You want to save the family, save the dad. Because they will follow his headship. As it's natural to do. So, how do we get back to simplicity? Get on mission. You do not need any more training to witness. How did you get saved? Tell them that. It's easy. How did you get saved? If you don't have anything to tell them, are you saved? You may not be. If you don't know what to tell somebody who's looking for salvation, I guarantee you, you're lost. You better know. Because if you don't know, you don't have a relationship with him, and I can't make that any clearer. You have to know. Next thing is, is get the word out. Volunteer to lead a Bible study. I shouldn't have to come tap you on the shoulder to get you to do what your husband is calling you to do. Lead a Bible study. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. That is what we are called to. What about your neighbors and your co-workers? Do they know you're a Christian? Or is your Christianity a bar to them coming? Because you don't have a good Christianity. Well, that's easily taken care of. Make it right. Do it right. Don't say anything to them. Change your behavior. And then once they notice that your behavior 
has changed, then bring it up. Then be a witness. Clean up your act. Make, set your priorities in order. Take advantage of the opportunities your pastors supply you with. Sunday morning and Sunday night. We have things available for you. Vacation Bible School. Folks, we need volunteers for Vacation Bible School. I think we've got five now. Five. What else you got going? Really? Small groups. Not just setting and eating all the time, but teaching and leading. If you need one-on-one -on -one discipleship, come see us. We will hook you up. We will help you in any way that we can. We will train you. We will do what needs to happen. And realize, folks, that these are the minimum requirements. Minimum. Well, I just don't have time for that. You really don't have time for the only person who's granting you eternal life. You really don't have time? Who's your God? I th actually, I think you, by that you know who your God is. Now it's time to cast down the idol. Put it in its place. Bring it into captivity to Christ. Folks, I want you guys to see yourself, if this is applied to you, as it applied to the Corinthian church, as casualties of war. You are. But what is not necessarily your fault is still your responsibility. Absolutely 100% your responsibility to deal with. Well, I was raised, it doesn't matter. He, Jesus Christ is not going to appoint at what somebody else did on the Day of Atonement unless it's Jesus Christ. When you stand before him, the only other person that might be able to step in is him. But any excuse that you have for, and, it's not, and this, is the, this is the terrifying thing. It's not just what you do, it's why you do it that you will be judged for. Your motive for doing it. Folks, if you've done something for him with the wrong motive, it's dirt under his feet. It's not acceptable before the throne. You have to have right motive and right action. So, that being said, I know that this was an intense message. Wednesday, we are going to have our members meeting. Wednesday, we are going to lay out some things that I think we can possibly get rid of some some misguided notions that the church has had, sometimes in some cases for up to 80 years. And I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about all American churches. We're going to try and deal with some of these issues in our church so that we can be a breath of fresh air, so that we can have the entire body of Christ on the same page, doing the same things for the right reasons. And we're going to talk about those on Wednesday night. And it relates directly to how we reach the next generations and how we interact with them. Because, folks, we've got, some, we've got to redeem the time. And, by the way, that's a gift that you get to do. If you have been astray, you can buy that time back. There's absolutely nothing that God can't go back and retrieve. Nothing. He's God. But you have to be in the right place to receive it. You have to have pockets big enough to hold it. Which means you have to have the character to be in the right place and be submitted to him so that he can act on your behalf. Otherwise, he can't. Because you are just a stumbling block to everything he's trying to do. Let's pray.